your world or your life the difference between arrogance and confidence? Oh, yeah. I mean, I see I see arrogant people out all the time. I think arrogance is a mask for insecurity. Um, confidence is quiet, you know, and confidence to me is is being able to give other people their moment and their spotlight and sharing space because you're not affected by someone else doing well. In fact, you want other people to do well around you. Whereas arrogance comes from like a, I think a darker place, a more negative place, um, that fear of scarcity, you know, whereas I think about uh, confidence, you live in a space of abundance. Like there's enough for all of us. Let's all enjoy. Whereas I think when I've met arrogant people, it's, it's always, I see their fear in their eyes. Arrogant people you want to stay away from. Confident people you'll follow. Yes, so, absolutely. So as we discussed earlier, one of the things I appreciate about you so much is being a role model for young ladies mm. who we talked about before begin to lose their uh, self-confidence around the age of nine. Yeah. So when I'm fairly certain that you've approached a lot of people or people mm -hmm. have approached you and they talk to you about their lack of confidence. Gee, I wish I could do what you do, mm -hmm. but. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I just did a web show around this topic um, with Taryn A. Idea, who is a writer and designer. And we were talking about the concept of self-care and self-love as it pertains to women. And this radical notion of just stop trying to be anything other than yourself living more in the space of who you are and not trying to shrink yourself to fit into other people's perceptions or spaces of you. I am myself, no matter where I go, no matter which group of people I'm around, you're, you're just going to get Natalie. Cause that's at this point, all I even know how to do. <laughs> um, and, and for better or for worse, you know, that, that's what it is. And, and I think where women and people in general, excuse me, where people in general come into trouble is when they start trying to pretend to be what they think other people want them to be. And mm. people see through that and whether you're trying to be disingenuous or not. And I don't think a lot of people are, I, I truly think they just want to fit in the the biggest thing that they're missing in that is just be you. And I know that sounds trite, but it's incredibly true. If you work on just who your authentic self is, that person will attract the right people into your life, you know, and those will be the people that you'll want to have in your life. And you'll let go of other things because then you won't feel the anxiety around people. So in the Buddhist world, we often talk about Flowers don't compare themselves to other flowers. Correct. They bloom. Yes. Yeah. Like, don't worry about... And, and that's so hard to say to a young woman because I've been there myself where, you know, of course you want to fit in. Everything is about wanting to fit in, and especially in high school or even college and in middle school especially. But, you know, the, the earlier you can start working on cultivating your sense of identity, the better off you'll be. So when we talk about cultivating sense of identity, if you're a, a flower... What are the three things that takes a flower to bloom? Yeah, you need that sunlight and you need that water and you need that good soil. Right. Mm -hmm. So we kind of translate that water into a holistic type of lifestyle where to take care of your physical body. And the sun, I keep referring, I go back to the 12-step world, and we call that the sunlight of the spirit, some type of connection with something. Right, Okay. Right. And then we talk about the environment, the people, places, things that you surround yourself with right. that help you grow. Well, and I think that where the problem comes in sometimes, or the challenge, I should say, is this expectation of you have to figure all of those out at the same time. And for me, at least, that all happened organically in stages with the, the spiritual component coming last. You know, I was really focused on my social world and, and my, and then the things I needed to do for myself. And then now as I've gotten a little older, that spiritual component, that energy, that understanding of being connected to something greater than yourself, that's starting to now, um, become more fully, I'm becoming more fully aware of that. Well, who do you spend more time with other than yourself? Exactly. So, and I think that's going back to what we were talking about, about time management. The good thing about time management is if you if you are able to harness your your time and your space, you then you are allowing yourself for moments where you don't have to run around and rush and you can focus on, you know, just the clarity of mind. And I think it is a problem that we try to fill every single minute of our day. I think that's really dangerous. And I purposefully leave holes in my schedule. I started doing that about a year ago, recognizing 
I was over scheduling myself and I actually was not just harming myself on a mental level, but in a professional level, because I didn't give myself any time to figure out what I actually wanted to do next. And so building in time for nothing, quote unquote, is actually a great use of your time. Spending your time like currency. Mm -hmm. The Greeks have a couple concepts of time. One is Kronos and the other is Kiros, K-I-A-R-A-S. Kronos time, Kronos was a Greek god, mm -hmm. okay, much like Mercury with the wings on his calves. And uh, one of the components of Kronos was well, once he got ahead of you, you could never catch up to him. Okay, so chronos, chronometer, uh, chronos time is structured time. Okay, it's clock time, and that's what most people live on the the the, the human doing type of time. Curious time is like the time of defining moments in life. Like athletes talk about being in the zone, okay? Uh, the Stoics called it studied in different, stepping back and looking at, uh, participating in your life, being right here and being right now. Have you ever had moments in your life, Natalie, where I call them pop-ins, where everything just bang, it's, oh my gosh, it's just everything's just so intense and you're right there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> Through doing yoga, too, I think I've become more aware of the present moment. So you you do sometimes get hit with a sense of everything all at once in your face, which actually is kind of cool. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a negative thing, especially if it's on like – there are some days where I just – ah, because it's so beautiful outside. You just get overwhelmed or something from just the experience of seeing – the sun, especially in Pittsburgh, <laughs> but I, I it, that has definitely happened to me. Yeah, well, sure. Does that happen to you? Well, oh, I guess. <laughs> so what we have, so what we have to help people do is to understand the difference between Chronos time and Kiros time, right? And attempt to help people live more in Kiros time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think it's I think it is important to learn how to how to hone that skill of time management and focus in because when you are focused in like today, for example, I'll give you a silly example, but I feel like I was definitely in that headspace when I was in my yoga class because she gave us two minutes to do whatever we wanted. And I was like, I really want to work on crow. And so I, I was focusing on crow, which is when you basically, it's like an arm balance and your legs are in the air and they're bent under you. And then you're on your forearms. And I was focused on this like little grain in the carpet and I did not even realize I held the pose for the whole time, which is just really for me like super hard to do because that's all upper body strength. So anyway, <laughs> point being, I think what you're talking about relates completely to sometimes the practices that we can do to help improve that part of our of our minds because I was so focused, I was so honed in on this little grain of nothing really that I was able to do something physically that in pretty much any other day of the week I would not have been able to do. And I, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for how much we can actually master things through just our minds. Well, sure. D.T. Suzuki was a, great, was a great Zen writer, and he said the best explanation of Zen was zero equals infinity. Yeah. So so the idea is, is we help people figure out what's important. Yeah. And, yeah. and and how to utilize what they have in front of them. Absolutely. So what we do is we say, I often ask people, I'll say, if everything else were taken away from you, your health, money, whatever in your life, who'd be with you at the end? who'd be with you, who'd never leave you. And then I asked them, who do you trust so much in your life that if they said, fall, I'll catch you, you'd fall without hesitation. Mm. And hopefully people would have some people in life. And then I challenged them. I said, did you ever tell them that? Mm. Did you ever sit down and say, I trust you so much that if you said fall, I'd fall without hesitation? Well, it's funny that you say that because the last time we talked, you had brought that up. Mm -hmm. And so I went home and I told my husband that. Yeah. And he was like, of course I would catch you. And I was like, well, I just wanted you to know that. I just learned that's, that today. I wanted to share that. That's important. And I hope you know I would do the same. It's important. <laughs> that's a bond. That's a connection. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's important. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, so, you know, people have a immortal view of their lives. And, yeah. you know, in Stoicism land, uh, tomorrow is one of the most dangerous words in the English language. <laughs> That's for sure. When when did you, though, have a first sense of your own mortality? Well, I think everybody out there in this program, and perhaps uh, those of you out there who haven't listened to the origin story, uh, we have a four-part series on that. But if I went through my own time of troubles, too. The drug and alcohol world had me deeply, deeply involved in mm. its snares. And uh, I was in uh, three psychiatric hospitals mm. in my life. And uh, I had a moment of clarity 
a connection with the divine mm. that in the end when when everyone surrenders when you say i'm done there's nothing left please help me yeah i'm done there's nothing left please please help me but then again your ego's still there oh yeah okay after whatever period of time my wife and i and believe me i had the largest part to play in this um decided that there wasn't enough air in the zip code to breathe mm -hmm. uh, so i went in back and with my mother of course mm -hmm. uh, and when you're a little older Living with your parents isn't that grand. Right. Uh, so I had belong, I'd been in twelve step recovery. I'd read the book once, so I was a guru. I was the I was the, I was a bleeding deacon. I was the guiding light that everyone should follow. So I went to this meeting. It was in Catanning. It was at uh, one o'clock on Tuesday afternoons, and I walked in there and sat down. And then this person came in. It looked like the drug of the river for him. And I thought to myself, huh. I'll bet he he just came in here to get out of the cold. He just came in here for a cup of coffee and or a donut. And then a little while later, I thought, he doesn't have a dollar in the basket like I do. I can put a dollar in the basket. I'll bet he doesn't. So the topic came up, and it says, how do you maintain your bond with your higher power? And I thought, how fortunate these people are to be here because I'm going to enlighten them. And it came around to my, I couldn't wait to talk. I didn't listen to anybody else, of course. <laughs> so it came around to me and I th said something that I thought would have made Shakespeare weep with shame, but I really, it was blithering idiocy. <laughs> and then he spoke and what he said was so beautiful uh, about a bond with the creator and a higher mm. power that I actually got up from that table and I went into the bathroom and I wept with shame. Oh. I wept with shame. Mm. And when I came back on, I came up to him and I said to him, like I told him exactly what I thought when he came. Mm. And I told him, I said, and then basically I said, you have everything. I've got nothing. Mm -hmm. And he looked and he put his hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eyes and said, I have a wonderful life. I hope you will too. Mm. And he didn't have socks on. He didn't have a belt on. And I never saw him again. Wow. Yeah. What a moment. That was the day my recovery began. Oof, that gave me chills. That was when it began. Wow. That's incredible. See, and isn't that funny? I don't think people sometimes even realize the things that they say, how they can impact somebody else. You know, words are very precious things. They can they can change somebody's life. Well, and this is the thing about mindfulness. Like we've discussed, Natalie, it's not about sitting on a satin pillow in Thailand with orange and crimson robes on, going mm all day, surrounded right. by 10,000 candles. Mm -hmm. It's paying attention on purpose. Exactly. Most of us have so much chatter going on in our head. That's the right. creation could be going around on That's around right. us, and we wouldn't know it. It's so true. And I also think you attract what you are focusing on, too. And so all of those distractions and all of those things, that will, and then, you know, when somebody will say, Oh, well, now I, now that I'm thinking about this, I see it everywhere, right? And so be careful what you start thinking and what your intentions are focused on because you do start to see it everywhere. Well, your vibe creates your tribe. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, so what type of energy am I putting out? There's another story. You know, it's people's perceptions, okay, perceptions. Sure. There was this plane load of tourists that landed in this country, and uh, – this couple got off and they walked up to this person that were walking outside the terminal and this old woman was sitting on a bench and they said, we're just new here. Tell us about the people in your country. And she said, well, tell me about the people in your country. Mm. And she said, and they said, well, they're kind of nasty and self-entitled and greedy. And the old lady said, well, I think you'll find people here the same. <laughs> and so the next couple come up and they asked her the same question. They said, oh, boy, we're new here. What do we see? What do we do? What, what can we expect? And she says, well, what are the people like in your country? And he says, well, they're generally kind and generous and friendly. And she says, I think you'll find people here the same. Exactly. No, it's true. It's, it's all – it comes down to um, your perception and – what you're looking for. So sometimes we do an exercise, Natalie, we're not going to do it right here, but I'll stand in, I'll stand and I'll have maybe students or whatever stand in front of me mm. and I'll be smiling and I'll, I'll say, I'm a horse. Okay. And some people say you're a jackass, but so that, that's okay. <laughs> but I say, what do you see? And I say, well, I see the smiling face of a horse. So I say, then move around behind me. Everyone move around behind me and I'll bend over and I'll say, I'll say, now what do you see? And I'll laugh and I'll say, well, I see the butt end of a horse. And then I'll ask him the question. Did the horse move? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they'll say no. Exactly. So we spend most of our life trying to manipulate people, places, yes. and situations yes. the way, and don't understand that we're the ones who can change perspective. That's that's a hundred percent right. And I think when you do 
focus your perspective on things that are good in your life or things that you're grateful for, things that you're, that are bringing you, you know, good energy, you feel better. And then once again, you attract more of that to you because that's what you're putting out there. And that's what I'm seeing from you, your vibe, your energy, uh, that people not only can look up to and possibly emulate, but you can actually tell them how you did it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And I mean, it's, it really is just like, like we were talking about, it's a choice every day, right? When you put your feet on the ground after you get out of your bed, how do you want to approach the world? And then that sets it off. That sets it all off because when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, we've all done it. You know, everything seems to just go wrong that day, right? Every little thing is frustrating and annoying. And I've literally, I've gotten to the point now where if that happens to me, I will stop myself and say out loud, I need to reset. I need to rethink this. I'm not going through the rest of the day thinking like this because it, I've seen it over and over and over again. When I change my mind, the day changes along with so me. So you're aware. Yes. Yes. Self-awareness. Aware, aware. Yes. Self-awareness. And, and I think having like, a sense of compassion for myself and the people around me because it's easy in this job in particular, we were talking about, you know, when people say something nasty or whatever, is was that really even about me? I mean, am I going to internalize that? Maybe they were having a bad day. Maybe they're going through something. Maybe I should just show them a little compassion and then, and then I can show myself some by not taking that home with me. You know, so I, I think we if we all did that, no matter what your jobs are, if something happens at work or at home or, you know, just take a step back and recognize that most likely it doesn't have as much to do with you as you assume that it does. And to, you know, hold yourself accountable and hold other people accountable, but also give everybody a little benefit of the doubt too. Well, we're all doing the best we can. So I we, believe that. We all have the benefit of the doubt. And like we talked about before, we talked about, you know, what are the requirements it takes to me. And I think we'll uh, end up today's uh, conversation because I know that you have other choices on how to spend your time your <laughs> currency. So these are some, these are kind of, uh, I think, kind of an individual's bill of rights. Yeah. So can you read that first one out loud, please? Yes. So these are the core emotional concerns. Number one, to feel understood. Okay. So you might, when you're dealing with somebody, you mm. might ask them, who understands you? Yeah. What's the second one? To feel appreciated. I think this one's really important. To feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. What's the next one? To be given the benefit of the doubt. Right. Well, there you go. So some people are not. Let's say you were my daughter, mm -hmm. and I'd be proud to have you. Uh, <laughs> however, I told you to be home at 11 o'clock. Right. You come strolling in at midnight. Mm -hmm. So rather than me jumping off the couch and barking at you, right. uh, explain yourself, young lady, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, Natalie may have a very good explanation for coming home an hour late. I'm right. going to listen to her. Right. There's so many people who don't get that. You know, and that's a really good point. And that sort of changes the tone of the interaction regardless of how it moves forward from there too, which I think is healthier for everybody, you know? So, and again, in the 12 step world, I keep talking about that. Um, at the end of the appendix two, which is called the spiritual experience. There's a quote by Herbert Armstrong. He was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. And it's to paraphrase it. It says there's one sure way to keep a person in an everlasting ignorance. And that principle is contempt prior to investigation. Wow. That's so real. What's the next one? To be treated as an equal. Uh, mm, yes. Nobody wants to be felt like they're being talked down to or that you're being condescending. Or less than. Of course. Yeah. That's, I, th I think treating everybody, well, for, for me, four and five are really being treated as an equal and then to be treated with respect or being treated respectfully. I think you, that's always should be the sort of your um, default position with people. And what's the last one? To the, have the freedom to decide. Yeah. Absolutely. Decisions. So I kind of think like if you have people in your life and they're not giving you Mm -hmm. these your friend group now they call it sure or whatever then what are they doing in your life that's actually a great way to gauge you should really do this for a living <laughs> <laughs> if you're not getting those if you have a friend group and they're not giving you those what are you doing with i them? agree i think this is a great way to test friendships romantic relationships and even you know relationships with family members because Family member relationships can be really challenging because, you know, you don't get to pick your family, so to speak. But I always say you can you can put healthy distance between you and people that you love but maybe don't like very much because of the way that they treat you. So it's also important to remember that you're allowed to step back from people if they're not 
serving you in the sense that if they're not making you feel like your best version of yourself. So generally, I ask people just to take it home, put it on their refrigerator, and don't tell anybody it's there. Yes. Yeah. So I challenge you to do that. I'm going to do it. Okay. (laughs) So what would you be taking away from today? You're just absolutely delightful, and I hope sometime in the future we can continue our conversation. For sure. I love coming and chatting with you, too. I I learn a lot. It's really just like a therapy session for me, so it's a good thing. (laughs) We can all use a little therapy. (laughs) So what what would be a message today that you'd like to... Uh, perhaps send out through the ether? Today, I think, is you are enough. Just where you are, just what you're doing, you are enough. Well, thank you so much, Natalie. And Mm -hmm. for those of you who enjoy this program, if you have any uh, comments, helpful criticisms, please contact us through our website. And as always, we offer a free prescription at the end of every podcast, fruits, nuts, and vegetables, and unplug your television and take up fishing. And for a truly mindful experience, we ask that you fish without bait. Do a kindness for yourself. Do a kindness for another. Forgive yourself. Forgive another. Till all are free and are free. Namaste. please check out our website at fishingwithoutbait.com where you can listen to the show, comment on our discussions, and find out where you can subscribe to our podcast. If you're interested in flying the colors of Fishing Without Bait, click the shop icon on our website. We have clothing, mugs, cell phone cases, and so much more. Show the world that you fish without bait. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.